Mike, one of the things we hear, and this, this specifically relates to, to abiraterone acetate, we know because of its mechanistic actions that there, there is a requirement for a little bit of corticosteroids. We, see, we hear this all the time from especially the community urologists is, oh, I don't want to give Abby. I don't want to have to deal with steroids. You, you've taken care of a number of these patients. You've used the drugs. What, what's your response to that from a urologist who's managing these patients? Yeah, I would basically tell the urologist we're cutting off the entire steroid production high up in the pathway. And our body produces seven and a half milligrams or so of, of steroids a day. And essentially, that's what you're giving back to them. Uh, and so you really, you know, shouldn't fear that. And, and, <clears throat> from, and I think the data is very clear now, long-term data. Uh, these patients take the drug for a long period of time, greater than 17 months. They tolerate the drug well. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and the risk of steroids, while present any, at any level, uh, is low uh, in this patient population. They seem to tolerate it fairly well. You may see some alterations in their blood sugar. That may be one of the more common things you see, uh, especially in the population we're dealing with, but in general, it's well tolerated. For your particular clinic, because again, we know the monitoring is a little bit more intensive for abiraterone, but, but, but nothing that's too onerous. Has, are you getting pushback from your, from your patients yeah. in terms of them having to come in and monitor their potassium, their hepatic, uh, their, their transaminases, those types of things? It's, you get a little pushback, especially if they've been normal every two weeks for the first month mm -hmm. or month and a half, and then they just stop showing up mm -hmm. instead of going through the three-month period. Um, and that's when we have now a nurse navigator calling them on the phone uh, maybe a week later. Uh, uh, to say, hey, you better come in and get your labs. But really, uh, it's a fairly easy process to monitor these patients. You make it automatic right at the beginning. They come in. Um, we typically see the changes, the alterations in liver function test. I'd be interested in the rest of the panel in the first six weeks of therapy, four to six weeks of therapy. Um, but uh, not a lot of pushback. Yeah, I, I think in my practice, if, if I may add, um, we all practice differently in many ways. Uh, we follow the data, obviously, but uh, what happens in clinical trials really ha is hard sometimes to translate into clinical right. practice. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you look at the data, we prevail on the data with the Cougar 302, although PSA was captured, it was never utilized to make decisions as to treatment failure or efficacy because the primary endpoint of this, these two trials was a composite endpoint between RPFS, radiographic progression, free survival, and survival. So I fundamentally have an issue with that uh, because I really believe these agents that target AR must, with a big capital, must lower your PSA, right? So I personally do this. I start the patient, once I make that choice, which is unclear how to make it, but once I made that choice as to do you start Abby or do you start ENSA, then I'll bring my patients the first four weeks. And in that four week visit is I wanna, I wanna see your side effects, you know, I wanna check your labs, and I wanna see your PSA. So if you're doing well clinically, you're not having major side effects, and your PSA is going down, then from then on, I'll match your appointment to the three-month injections, if you will, if you're getting LHRH therapy. On the contrary, if they're doing well, they're not having side effects, uh, they're doing clinically, clinically well, but their PSA is rising, then I tell them, I wanna check your PSA again in one month. I wanna see what that PSA does. You know, I'll bring you back. And if within the first three months, you know, I don't see a PSA decline, in my practice, I stop and abort any of those oral treatments and move forward because I don't believe those patients will benefit you know, from these compounds. Even though the level one evidence, phase three data, would suggest that you're allowed to continue in a patient on that therapy until you develop radiographic progression, for me, I personally think that you just simply seeing the natural history of their disease progressing in your face without actually active therapy. Can I just point out that in the 302 study, the patients who had no PSA decline had a survival that was basically the same as the tax exactly. 327 exactly. patients, exactly. about 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. And so those patients probably aren't benefiting at all. Mm, I do the right. same thing. Yeah. I typically go 12 weeks. If, the, if I haven't seen a PSA decline at all, they're off the therapy and onto something else. And actually, we now know that these might be the patients with the V7. Exactly. And, and right. in fact, mm -hmm. it, it, it sort of raises the question of, do we, you know, do, we do a therapeutic yeah. trial of just see where they are? And mm -hmm. in, 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 there's not a lot of harm done, I think, in eight weeks of a therapy if you're starting somebody reasonably early. Uh, so it, it's almost like doing a clinical test of abiraterone or enzalutamide may prevent the need for the V7. It's not as elegant, but... Yeah. but 
But you know, to me, that actually contradicts, Chuck, exactly everything that we have tried to do over the <laughs> yeah. last 10 years. PSA is, PSA is not the best tool, but we should not chase their PSA, right? right. Yet we know, yeah. you know that the level one evidence was one way, but we mm -hmm. practice in a different right. way because we realize the importance of PSA reduction in the context of these oral therapies. Is It is different when you see a patient that has a PSA decline, and over time, you know, the PSA starts to rise, and those are the patients that are much right. more challenging yeah. for us to manage. Can I just ask to both of you guys a practical question? You know, as, as a uro for the urologist listening in, so did I hear you correctly to say you at four you get a PSA at four weeks? Yep. If there's no PSA response, you switch gears at the four week point. I usually no. do twelve weeks. No, I, both correct. of you do the twelve week. I, I do monthly PSAs for the first three months right. for those patients who don't have a PSA decline. You know, because I want to see the, the change over time. Right, but sometimes what you see, you see a PSA that goes up within the first four weeks, and then you what what I call broken. You know, when I was in San Francisco, that was what we called the broken arrow. You know, the yeah. PSA goes up yeah. and then goes down. So we want to make sure that we capture those patients because it right. would be a mistake for us to stop therapy for those patients. Right. So at four weeks, if your PSA is going up, I'll give you an extra four weeks just to make sure that that PSA is not really actually going down. And sometimes you see a 20, 30% of patients who have PSA declines. However, if at that eight week mark, your PSA continues to rise, then I'll tell the patient, you more than likely are not gonna respond to this oral therapy. We're gonna see you in four weeks. And if your PSA in that four week mark at 12 weeks is again rising, we stop there. Yeah, well put. So basically what you're, what you're describing is a primary resistance exactly. versus exactly. the acquired exactly. secondary exactly. resistance. Yeah. So Chuck, you, you briefly mentioned 302. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for again, the audience, mm -hmm. I think we all know what 302. Give us, tell us what 302 is, the Cougar 302, because you've reported on some recent updated analysis of that data, right? Right, we've published the final analysis of 302 uh, earlier this year in Lancet Oncology. And um, as many people are aware, uh, this was a randomized trial of abiraterone plus prednisone versus placebo plus prednisone. And I think the key point was this was the first uh, phase three trial that, that tested this chemotherapy naive patient population and looked at survival with, with this type of drug. Uh, and so the study went through a number of interim analyses. The first interim, the second interim analysis, I should say, was reported a couple of years ago and published. And so with the final analysis, there's um, uh, the vast majority of the patients have have passed away at this point, and it allows a fuller uh, appreciation of the of the survival. So the high the headline is basically the median survival for these patients was about 35 months. Uh, the hazard ratio. Uh, compared to the placebo arm was about 0.81, so about a 20% improvement in survival. There was a huge amount of crossover. Uh, um, the 44% uh, of the patients who were allocated to the placebo arm actually received abiraterone at some point in their in their life after after study therapy. Uh, and so those are the key points. But um, uh, there are many other subtler right. points that may be helpful for the practicing physician. So number one is there's a 10-month delay, for example, in the need for opiate analgesics. So when I talk about the benefits of, of treating early in this setting, I, and I use this term with patients, I talk about the three Ps, uh, preserve quality of life, prevent complications and progression, and prolong life. And that resonates with what patients want to get out of, uh, out of therapy. And, and basically the 302 uh, showed that it was, there was a statistically significant uh, delay in the time to performance status deterioration, so preservation of quality of life, uh, there was a, a significant decline in the uh, bone events. Fred Saad has right. reported on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know the survival data now. So I think that that encapsulates uh, the clinical benefit of abiraterone in this chemotherapy-naive patient population.